Okay, thank you very much, uh, Andrew. So um, you've heard me introduce OSLC several times. Um, I will do it to, again today, but from a new perspective, uh, I will describe OSLC as an enable, enabler for a distributed link creation strategy. Um, that will also help me uh, introduce the key aspects of OSLC. So if you're completely new to OSLC, and maybe you're a software architect, you want to understand, you know, what 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 are OSLT and APIs? What are OSLT and APIs? And what can I do beyond the OSLT APIs? I, I hope that this short presentation will give you um, uh, enough information. And I will finish on a more maybe controversial topic. It's the OSLT phase, so I'm looking forward to also hearing your feedback. And I personally think that. Um, a distributed link creation strategy can also change the way we actually look at standards and how we achieve interoperability. So I'll get to that at the end. Um, so as we all know, ideally, we want to achieve end-to-end -end traceability across the different lifecycle phases, the different engineering disciplines. As a system engineer, I want to achieve this holistic system overview and understand how things are related. I'm, at, I'm speaking here at the OSLC Fest, so no need to talk more about this. I do want to remind everybody that a link is actually super simple. It's just, just composed of three parts, a link source, a link target, and a link type. So when we're talking about links, we're not talking about uh, category theory or uh, partial differential equations. It's fundamentally of something extremely simple. Um, Nevertheless, in our day-to-day -day lives, it's, it's actually not that simple to work with links. Uh, we often have to use specific applications to create the links. These are applications that serve also a, a data integration role. So I'm thinking of PLM, ALM, or also MBSE applications that actually either collect data from different sources or at least they cover uh, data from different engineering domains. And they allow the engineer to also create these cross-domain links inside the application. And based on that, you get many fantastic capabilities to, to manage these links, to, to see them in tables and visualize them differently in graphs and, and analyze them. So I'm not criticizing the capabilities of these centralized applications, but I'm questioning if engineers have to necessarily create the links inside these applications. Using the capabilities to manage the links, of, that's, that's perfect. But are the engineers really forced to have to switch applications and, and have to create the links in one application? I, I think that this strategy is not successful. Um, it's, I think it creates a bottleneck. Uh, for several reasons. Uh, relying on a single application is, first of all, not user-friendly. Many engineers um, just prefer to stay within their familiar applications. They don't want to have to learn a new application, like a PLM application, to create links. Um, also, some of these centralized applications that offer the capability to define cross-domain links, they try to be the center of the universe, but they also uh, follow some business incentives, meaning that you know, they don't support any kind of integration. Uh, and there's often vendor lock-in that prevents actually data to be ingested in that centralized application. So there are some risks associated with, with this strategy. Um, these applications, centralized applications also don't support a flexible schema, at least not always, um, but that's what we want if we want to create ad hoc new links, having new link types to new link targets. And if we want to do this as needed at the time that we want, we, we don't have to, we don't want to have to ask a system administrator to update the schema or whatever. We just want to do it as an engineer. Um, I'll get to, you know, that we obviously have to prevent chaos and that there need it's, it's necessary to have linking rules. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, another aspect also is that 
behind these centralized applications is typically a single kind of database. And uh, not always, but often. And it's not possible for a database to be the perfect fit for all purposes. So that's why we've seen that IoT data that creates huge quantities of data need, need to be saved in the cloud on, on, scale, in, on in scalable databases, for example, in data lakes. Whereas PLM data is traditionally saved in relational databases for performance reasons. So it's, 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 um, if it's already, you know, we, we do rely on different databases. We, we do need, for different purposes, we need to use different kinds of databases. So we, we have to support actually uh, the management of data in different data sources. So now I come to this different kind of paradigm, uh, data integration paradigm, uh, based on a distributed link creation strategy where the links are not create, created in one central application, but actually in the applications that the engineers use on a day-to-day -day basis. And all the applications are actually equal uh, from the perspective of creating links. Uh, an engineer can create a link uh, between artifacts from within any application. That, that's what I call a distributed link creation uh, approach. Uh, you obviously want to prevent the creation of some garbage links, so you need to enforce some linking rules. Um, and the advantage is that you know this approach, first of all, is user friendly. Uh, engineers don't have to switch applications. Uh, this approach is actually inspired by, by the World Wide Web. We know that it can scale, and um, you know if you look at the content on the web, it has been created uh, by uh, creators who work in a distributed way, who each create their, their web pages, uh, not through one single application, but all separately. And, and they add their links also separately. And this kind of approach scales, we, we know this. Um, if you have to rely on one single application to, if, if we had to rely on one single application to, to create content on the web, we, I don't think the web would be what it is today. Um, and I'll, I'll get to the last bullet point about you know, the, the, the schemas and the standardization efforts and the benefits that, that a distributed link creation strategy can provide uh, at the end. So keep in mind that link cre creation and link storage and link management are different things. We often think, oh, I created a link in this application, so necessarily the link is saved in this application. No, that's wrong. The link can be created in one application and it can be saved in a different application. It can actually be saved in multiple different applications at the time of creation. If you want to see your link in your PLM solution so that you can take advantage of its you know, visualization and, and analysis capabilities, that's totally fine. OSLC is completely agnostic to the storage location for the links. If you want to see the links in a SysML model, that's totally fine as well. Query them in a graph database, that's totally fine as well. Actually, it's, it's often the case that when a link is created, the link is saved in the source application of the link, as well as in the graph database, as in the graph database, as well as in the target application of the link. So that, that's very common. Um, but associated with that link storage location are also link management capabilities. A graph database is good for, good for, good for querying the links. Uh, another application might, might be good at visualizing the links. Um, we might create the links, save them in, in different uh, databases, and then later uh, actually want to still be able to do something different with the link. And with OSLC, once a link has been created, it's actually exposed to API clients. So that if we decide, for example, today, okay, I want to apply category theory because I just heard the talk and it actually seems useful, but as an input, I need these links, these OSLC links. Well, thanks to OSLC, having access to the links is really simple. You can collect them easily. And then you do your processing uh, with, with category theory if you want to do it. 
um, you're not tied to one single application to manage the links. And I think that's very, very important. So OSLT enables this decoupling from link creation and link management. I, I think it's, it's, it, it does change the game, I think, um, for, for many things. So now I've introduced briefly, you know, what is distributed link creation. I'll quickly go over the aspects that I think make OSLT really stand out. So when you hear about links, you probably think of RDF, you might think of link data and the semantic web. And I've seen many initiatives use RDF, but I've only seen the OSLC initiative really try to demo democratize the link creation process so that end users, like human users, the knowledge workers can create links without having to know anything about RDF. Um, and that's because when you create a link, you actually need to find a link target, which is located in a different application. And each application has different search capability, has a different search capability. One application might, might manage thousands of, of artifacts and you need to not just use a full text search, you might need to use um, uh, additional filters. Whereas a different application might just have a simple search and it's gonna be, it's gonna be fine. So OSLC understands that the search capability is, is specific to each application, but that it can be packaged in a way, in a dialogue, in a standard way that can be embedded in another application. So each OSLC API will expose this search dialogue, which can then be embedded, for example, in this test cases application to create a link to requirements or an element in another of these target applications. So the user friendliness um, of creating links is, is fantastic. I, I think it's, it's great that we have, we're not forcing people to, to know about REF, to manipulate REF or to depend on developers to manipulate REF. No, with OSLC, that complexity is hidden away. Now, let's say a, an engineer has selected his link target and he wants to create the link. And we see here an example of an API client that will submit a request to add these new links uh, to the API that is in front of a data source. This data source here, just for simplicity, it manages squares, okay? And we see here, there, there's no per update operation on this blue square to add two new links to these two purple squares. So a traditional API will actually check the request and see, okay, does it match some rules? Is this update request, does it conform to what is expected? In this case, because this data source manages squares and it has links to squares, the request is successful. But if we had links to something new, something like triangles um, describing in this case, uh, you know, an artifact from a different data uh, source, this data source managing only squares would actually block this request from being successful. And it would just tell back, tell the client that it's a bad request. And that's because typically APIs, they adopt the closed world assumption. And for a good reason, they want to prevent chaos. They don't want to have to um, manage all kinds of rubbish on their end. They only want to allow certain operations. So, and that's totally fine. But the problem is that this prevents actually the creation of links to unexpected new link targets. So this is why an OSLT API in contrast to a traditional API, it needs to support an open world assumption so that if it sees here links to some triangles, it will actually accept that operation and it will process it and possibly save the links in this data source or in, an, in a different one. But now you might say, okay, well, if an OSLT API now supports the cross-domain linking and, and links to unexpected link targets, um, we can end up with chaos because 
Now, all kinds of rubbish links could be created by the API clients. So we can prevent this. Okay, we still engineers, we, we, we like, we love the closed world uh, flavor um, and it's for good reasons. Um, so we can still define some linking rules, okay, to prevent that chaos from happening. But ideally, these linking rules should be decoupled from the OSLC API so that the OSLC API can be reused in many different organizations, many different contexts, many different projects. And sometimes, you know, um, a certain uh, link will be considered valid and sometimes it won't be considered valid, but that will be defined and managed easily separately from the OSLC API in, in, in a registry for linking rules. And, and so if OSLC API support this open world assumption, it can be reused more easily in, in different contexts. Often I, I see these linking rules and the, and the OSLT API implementations com, all, all combined. And so it, it's, um, it's, not, it's not ideal, I would say. Um, so we've, we've covered just a few steps, okay, of the life cycle of a link from the first step when a human user wants to search for a link target, um, and we've covered also the open API, open world assumption nature of an OSLT API. There are additional steps, okay, in this link, this link creation process and in the life of a link. Um, and next to them, you can see the unique aspects of an OSLT API that, that make it work. Um, I didn't cover everything in this short uh, amount of time that I have. Just one note, I think that the link status is extremely relevant because if one end of a link is modified or deleted, the link may actually become irrelevant or unmeaning, uh, it may no longer have any meaning. And so it needs to be flagged as invalid or suspect. And uh, I don't think that we have an OSLC standard to describe the link status. I think that there is a within Jazz, there is a standard way to do this, but it's not an official OSLT standard. Um, please, t please tell me after my talk if I'm wrong. Um, TRS has been covered by other speakers. So, and you know, then we have, in addition to the links, we've got other aspects to manage the entire links, like global configuration management, et, et cetera, which other speakers have addressed. So now I'll get to my last point um, about interoperability and how it can be achieved faster and cheaper if we adopt a distributed link creation strategy. So interoperability means that two different applications can exchange data and they agree on the format, they agree on the meaning of the exchange data, and it's actually technically very easy to achieve. Obviously, some, some of these standards are more complex than others, uh, but, and we've seen many examples of the successful adoption of these standards. So I'm thinking here of, of this, some step standards covering the 3D geometry, FMI in the simulation domain, RecIF uh, for requirements. And so domain specific standards, if by domain specific, I mean, I mean standards that really have a very clear scope. They tend, that's my opinion, to be relatively small. So they tend to be relatively manageable. It's easy to get consensus and it's easy for them to get adopted. Now, unfortunately we have this trend that's still ongoing to try to create all these cross domain links within one central application. And along with that, we also have a trend to define standards to describe data from multiple domains and the cross domain links, but in one single standard, one single, what I would call monolithic multi-domain schema. I'm thinking here of MOSSEC or of PLCS. So these are initiatives coming from the step world. But to be honest, you know, you can also think of a systems modeling language as part of, of that you know, multi-domain monolithic standard. I personally, I, I was a, I am, I mean, I was a big proponent of SysML, okay, for, for over 10 years. Um, but I, 
I do have to realize that some of the parts of SysML, like requirements and system behavior, well, they can be better described in more specialized tools. And it's, it's actually, as a systems engineer, you know, if I, if I see the evolution of SysML, how slowly it has adapted, how slowly the tools have adapted. I, 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 I mean, it's not, I don't see the speed of change that I would like to see. Um, and I think it has to do that SysML, it covers many different aspects of a system. It, it assumes that people have to describe all these cross domain links in one tool. So you need a standard for that tool. Um, and, um, but is it, it, is that assumption still valid now that we can create the links in a distributed way? Um, I personally think that by creating the links in a distributed way, we can focus our standardization efforts on the domain specific standards, on these cross domain link types. We can completely forget the efforts to try to achieve these multi-domain standards, which we've seen in the last years. I, I don't really think that they provide a clear value um, so may, maybe, you know, it's time to revisit that assumption if, if you know, there's a lot of money spent in, in these standardization efforts. If maybe, you know, I, I'm, maybe I'm dreaming, I'm probably dreaming it will take 10 or 20 years until standardization efforts focus on, on, on the cross domain links, as I'm showing here, and the domain specific standards. Um, but th think of requirements, for example, they are covered by step standards, by the OMG standards, by domain specific requirement standards by OSLC also. So, you know, do we need all these standards just to describe requirements? Um, if, I, if I look at the schema.org vocabularies, uh, there's no redundancy, there's no semantic overlap. Um, when they needed interoperability to describe COVID data, it happened very quickly. There was no coupling be between that data and something else within a few weeks they had the, the standard for COVID data. Um, I think in engineering things should go way faster and, um, and I think this is possible by, by focusing on, on the smaller standards. Um, one note also after the talk we've heard about applied category theory, it sounds as if we can go way deeper than REF, we can use strong mathematical concepts that go I think beyond also first order logic and it sounds extremely promising. It sounds as if that, that should maybe be the foundation for, um, for describing semantics. Um, I, I will be very brief. I really think that by creating the links in a distributed way in different applications, it changes completely uh, how we view data integration. Um, and I'll, I'll stop here. And um, if you have any questions, please, please let me know.